Hi, everyone. Welcome to a presentation that is a re-recording of the webinar, The Why and How of Protected Bike Lanes. Uh, we had technical difficulties yesterday, July 13th, when this was recorded, so we are happy to bring this uh, more cleaner version for you so that you can easily get through the material and uh, make use of it. So thanks for listening in and watching our re-recording. Uh, my name is Linda Kamushi, and I'm with the California Bicycle Coalition, and uh, we will get started today with our agenda. We have our executive director, Dave Snyder, and he'll be going through CalBike's role in uh, promoting protected bike lanes. We are happy to have Brian Jones with us. He's with uh, Alta Planning, and he'll be going through his really informative presentation on separated bikeways, and uh, we had a, a great amount of questions that were on the live webinar, so we'll be going through those and answering those, and so uh, with that, I introduce our uh, ED, Dave Snyder. Thank you, Linda, for that introduction, and welcome everyone to this webinar. The California Bicycle Coalition's mission is to enable more people to ride bicycles for healthier, safer, and more prosperous communities for all. And by more people, we mean everybody, not just the athletic folks who are willing to get into lots of gear and ride really fast in traffic. We mean the average person who really needs some greater safety and protection from traffic. And so we strongly support protected bike lanes. And uh, believe it or not, in California just a couple of years ago, the uh, ability to put a bike lane separate from tra traffic with some kind of barrier uh, was not permitted in California until we pa passed a bill creating a new class of bikeway called the Class 4 Separated bi Bikeway. And now everybody in California is able to install that facility. We're currently working to promote these things uh, much more broadly. We're going to address the topic at our summit coming up in October in Sacramento. I hope you can make it. Uh, we are going to work with Caltrans to develop uh, some guidelines to help people decide when protected bike lanes are the appropriate treatment. And we are helping with folks who need some advice on the process to get them approved and designed, which is uh, the why we have this webinar today. I'm uh, very uh, uh, happy to be working with a coalition of organizations, uh, the Rails to Trails Conservancy, uh, the California Walks, and the Local Government Commission as part of the Active Transportation Resource Team. We are providing help to agencies across the state, especially disadvantaged communities, uh, and, and helping them uh, all aspects of active transportation uh, including protected bike lanes. Uh, I'm really glad that we have Brian Jones here today to lead this webinar. Brian uh, is one of the uh, foremost experts on bikeway design, including how to get them uh, approved in difficult environments. He has a ton of experience. He served as the Director of Public Works for the City of Fremont and as the Chief Traffic Engineer across the state in, in cities such as Carlsbad and Fresno. He is uh, the, the absolute best person to be advising you, and I am very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Brian Jones. Thank you, Dave, for that nice introduction and for um, having me present today. Um, we're really excited, and Alta has been helping many agencies uh, throughout the nation implement separated bikeways. Um, you, you might, and I'll just start off with, you, you're going to see a bunch of terms, and you've already heard a number of terms, separated bikeways, protected bike lanes, cycle tracks. Um, they're all interchangeable. In California, the legal term for them uh, that was adopted with the bill is separated bikeways, and that's a class four facility in the highway design manual for the state of California. So, um, but if you're Googling throughout the, the nation, you might also look up cycle tracks or protected bike lanes or separated bike lanes. Um, they're all interchangeable 
uh, words and different jurisdictions call them different things. So just a heads up on that. Um, so um, I will begin with separated bikeways and a bicycle. These are bicycle infrastructures focused on all ages and abilities, as Dave alluded to. Um, so we're, today we're going to go over some of the history and current status of separated bikeways and the latest design guidance from Caltrans, FHWA, and NACTO, and, and some other manuals that might be useful for you as you're designing these. Um, and we're going to talk about building class four separate bikeways from a local agency perspective. And also, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, they're so expensive, we can't do this. And there's a lot of ways to do them with low cost uh, um, solutions focused on implementation. And I always say, where there's a will, there's a way. And sometimes we just have to create the will because there's op opportunities uh, to make these happen in every city throughout the state of California. So going to FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, um, I love this picture right here. This is what we want to see on all our streets, a mother and her daughter enjoying our streets on their bicycles. Um, you know, this is the pinnacle of success um, when people can choose to ride their bikes um, and make the healthy choice the easy choice in our communities. So, um, but in 2010, FHWA came out with a design accommodations memo, um, and I, there's a lot of words on this slide, and so I provided a link, and you can go to that link and, and find out more information. Um, but focusing in on a couple areas, go beyond the minimum requirements. You know, oftentimes the minimum width for a bike lane is five feet, and that's the bare minimum. Um, maybe the preferred should be six feet with two foot buffers and, and your agency can take on those preferred uh, desired and it could be something different for every every intersector, every roadway in your city. And uh, we're focused on increasing the use for bicycles and pedestrians of all ages and abilities. And this is really, really important as we move forward. It's no longer just building roadways for cars. It's about how do we accommodate all modes of users uh, on our streets as they try to uh, navigate our cities and communities and neighborhoods. 2013 design flexibility memo came out um, and this was really focused on uh, allowing people to utilize their engineering licenses and, and become engineers and design things rather than just applying standards and I think this is a great opportunity for us to do a not one size fits all approach and so um, so bringing a flexible approach and really guidelines rather than standards. Um, and, and in this design flexibility memo, they said, Let, we want to support the use of NACTO and IT and other resources that are being able to be adopted even quicker um, than maybe FHWA can provide the resources or go to other states or, or, or look for guidance wherever it is and then document it. And I think that's the important thing. And at, at documentation is important when you're making an engineering decision. Why did you do this? And then just put it down in the memo, in the document, so that if somebody's trying to figure out why you did this five or 10 years ago, it's really easy to find in the project folders. Um, FHWA created the Separated Bike Lane uh, Planning and Design Guide, and it was released in May of 2015. It's, a, it's the premier document. Uh, in the nation for separated bike bike lanes, or one of them, I should say, and it's released in May 2015. And, and so, I, I often say there's been more evolution and progress in active transportation guidance in the last five and ten years than the previous five to eight decades combined. And so, um, and every year we're evolving and, and learning new things and trying new things. And I and uh, failure is is not trying to implement separated bikeways. Um, so the design guidance uh, for the separated bikeway um, is encourages the use of all appropriate design resources as well as continued experimentation and modification of design in order to develop safe, comfortable, and predictable separated bike lane treatments. And I think that is an important part when you're making your engineering decisions. Elaborate on this is we're we're trying this out because we believe it'll enhance the safety, uh, comfort, and predictability of the bike lane design, uh, separated bike lane design. 
And as we move forward, um, bicycle and pedestrian projects, including separate bike lanes, are eligible for federal aid highway and transit program funding categories. This is super, super important right now. Um, you know, as we are looking at building more bus rapid transit and light rail and streetcars, these aren't add-ons. Um, these need to be put into the project descriptions and purposes at the federal level so that your projects are eligible um, and, and can be uh, implementing active transportation because after all, a transit project is, is, is basically, uh, the customers are people that are walking and biking. And so um, we need to make sure that the customers, the first and last mile, can get to those transit stops. Um, but FHWA realized that there were a lot of decades of misconceptions about what their money could be used for and how they could use it and what you could do. And so um, back on August 20th of 2015, uh, they created this addressing common misconceptions. And the irony was I went, I printed this out and I went into a meeting with a DOT agency uh, two days later and, and they told me all these misconceptions and then I passed this document across and they said, oh, we're going to have to change our policies because this is, we, we adopted something at the state level that is incorrect with our understanding at the federal level and how we can use funds. And so it was a really informative document that a lot of people didn't even know came out. So going back and finding that document is a, is a really important one. The link is right there on the page. Um, and here's a lot of different funding opportunities right here. Tiger, FTA, CMAC, ACIP, um, you know, in California we have the ATP. And it just talks about where the funding can be used for different types of bicycle improvements, including bicycle parking and racks on transit and, and bike, bicycle share programs. Um, but this clarifying document really focused on federal funds can be used to build protected bike lanes, separate bike lanes, cycle tracks, however you want to call them. Uh, federal funds can be used for road diets. Engineers are allowed to use design guides other than the AASHTO Green Book. That is super important. And then highway funding can be used for bike and pedestrian infrastructure. And vehicle lanes don't have to be a certain width to receive federal funds. That is super important, and we're going to get into that a little bit more in this presentation, uh, because a lot of times people said, oh, they have to be 12-foot lanes. 12-foot lanes are what we use on freeways. They don't have to be used on our arterials and collectors and, and our local streets. Um, and it takes leadership and engineers to do things and utilize those AASHTO design guidelines uh, and, and use those engineering judgment capabilities. Um, curb extensions, roundabouts, and trees can be used on streets. Um, and speed limits do not need to be set using the average 85th percentile vehicle speeds. Um, however, in California, that is the law. And so what you need to do is redesign your street so that the outcome is a slower speed and we'll get, and protected bike lanes are one way in which you can lower the speeds uh, of the roadway, which has a direct correlation with safety of your roadway. And so we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but FHWA also came out with road diets and road diets are one way to create space on the roadway by uh, repurposing some of the travel lanes, uh, whether it's going from a, a conventional four lane roadway to a three lane roadway and adding bike lanes or separated bike lanes. That's one way to create space on the roadway. Another way, and that's the, the link right there, um, another way of creating space is just by repurposing the lane widths. Um, you know, oftentimes we have 12, 13, 14, I've seen 20 foot, 24 foot travel lanes in some of our communities. And they said, we don't have room to put in separated bikeways. And I'm like, wow, you have so much room on your roadways, uh, uh, we, we can put in two separated bike lanes. Uh, um, so, um, you know, when we apply 12-foot travel lanes into our streets, we get 55-mile-an-hour roadways. Um, and really, um, our arterials can have 10 to 12. Our collectors can have 10 to 12-foot foot travel lanes. Our local roadways can have 9 to 12, according to AASHTO. And so going back to some of those documents and, and reviewing some of those documents, rather than just taking what the, the standard was for a highway design manual, um, but really looking at your local perspective and how do you build communities and streets that are relevant uh, and profitable and economical and, and really allow people to be connected and thrive in your communities. And I think you'll find that narrower travel lanes are going to address a lot of those needs 
and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, when we talk about Caltrans mission, new mission statement. Um, but I think lane width under uninterrupted flow conditions operating at low speed and narrower lane widths are normally adequate and have some advantages. Wow, that's amazing that Astro came out with that in 2011. Um, and then 10-foot travel lane considerations appropriate for interrupted flow, roads with signals operating at low speeds, 35 to 45 miles an hour. A lot of people will say, oh, our fire truck or our bus can't get down a 10-foot lane. Well, when you have a separated bicycle lane facility or buffered bike lane or whatever, there's overhang for their mirrors, and so you can accommodate them. Um, but a lot of times we're we're building really wide travel lanes to um, accommodate a mirror for a bus that comes down that roadway five, ten times an hour. Um, and what we're really doing is, is we're enhancing the speed for the other 98% of the roadway users, and speed has a direct correlation with safety. And so while we might have to replace a mirror occasionally on buses or on cars, um, we're often seeing lawsuits for fatalities and severe injuries on roadways in the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars on our roadways. And so I think there's opportunities uh, for us to, to look at our lawsuits and, and our, our concerns a little differently. Um, so uh, mixed results of 10-foot lanes over 45 miles an hour, that doesn't mean they can't be used over 45 miles an hour. It's just you need to use a little bit more engineering judgment on that. Um, and, and so as we transition from the federal level to the state level at Caltrans, the state of California Department of Transportation, they've been really making a, an incredible push uh, to um, transition uh, to all ages, all abilities, active transportation, and we'll get into more of that. But their mission statement says it all. Caltrans improves mobility across California was their old mission statement, and their new mission statement says to provide a safe, sustainable, integrated, and efficient transportation system. And that's all focused to enhance California's economy and livability. We're asking transportation to improve California's economy and livability. So we need to start doing things a little differently than we've done before because that's not what we were asking transportation to do for the last five or eight decades, although some might argue that that was the case. Um, so there was also... Uh, some research, and we'll get into the research a little bit more, um, and there was a blog created that says California's DOT emits more roads mean more traffic, and so if you build it, they will come. Uh, it's called induced demand, um, and here's some freeways um, that uh, show um, just how uh, parking lots can be created when you design roadways and transportation facilities solely for the use of automobiles, and you don't give people choices and options. And um, that information from the National Center of Sustainable Transportation, increasing highway capacity is unlikely to relieve traffic congestion. That was done by Susan Handy, a PhD uh, professor at University of California, Davis, and she's uh, done a, 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 an incredible amount of research into vehicle miles traveled. And the irony is vehicle miles traveled is the, the new level of service analysis tool, and we're supposed to be reducing the vehicle miles traveled. And so to reduce vehicle miles traveled, we need to figure out how to provide choices, options, and better design so that people can make these other choices, that easy choices in their daily lives. Um, and in 2014, um, Tim Craggs at the time was the chief of the Division of Design, and, and he said, um, he came out with this document that after the SSTI report was done for Caltrans, and it really says that a one-size-fits-all design philosophy is not the departmental policy. That is phenomenal. That is, and, and it was brought out in its own paragraph right there in the document. Um, and um, when people talk about design immunity, it, we just need to be documenting our engineering decisions, going back to is it safe, is it comfortable, is it inviting? Um, is it creating space? Um, are we balancing the needs of all users of the roadway rather than just the throughput of vehicles? Um, and as Caltrans says, all streets in their deputy directive uh, 64R2 um, says uh, that all projects shall be complete streets. 
projects. And so um, do, are we looking at our transportation improvements, uh, whether it's a bridge railing replacement or a retrofit or an overlay project, are we looking at those as opportunities to implement complete streets? And I think that is where, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the presentation, a great way that we can be leveraging our, our resources and funds when it comes to transportation and changing our practices to align with the policies and directives. Um, but we have some exciting news that's been happening at Caltrans uh, with the California MUTCD and the, tra the traffic ops headquarters up in Ca Sacramento has been working around the clock with their very small team but very mighty team um, uh, led by Duper uh, to uh, update the California MUTCD and we're meeting regularly. I serve on the California Traffic Control Devices Committee representing bicyclists and pedestrians statewide for the state of California. Department of Transportation, and uh, in March of 2016, they were talking about hybrid beacons, uh, experimenting with two-stage left-turn cue boxes in Sacramento, uh, modifying lane uh, shared lane markings, uh, the bike boxes, uh, more bike boxes, and in September of 2016, they went to Greenback Share, explored experimentation with Greenback Sharrows. And then Pasadena was looking at more bicycle boxes. Um, and then Los Angeles DOT was looking at two-stage bike, bike boxes. And so there's been a number of progresses. In, and if you go to this uh, California Traffic Control Device Committee uh, webpage, you can read the whole agenda. And it's very educational and informative about and the minutes in, of these discussions of the 10-person panel. and, and Back in 2011-12, Caltrans ex expanded the eight-person California Traffic Control Devices Committee to have 10 people and two people, uh, Mike Salivar Salivary from SFMTA and myself are, are there to represent active transportation. And, and that was a, a, a big change when we were asked to be active transportation representatives rather than non-motorized representatives. Um, and so, um, in 2017, um, we talked about accessible pedestrian signals and barrier posts and senior plaques. Um, and these are all improvements uh, being focused on the most vulnerable users of our roadway to enhance their design. But we have some exciting stuff coming up at the MUTCD. Um, and we're stri striping the space for bicycle use locations at right turn only lanes. And there's going to be some improvements in the signing and striping of that and then changes in the shared lane marking section uh, to give better direction on where those sharrows should be placed in the lane um, and their purpose. And so, and then in November 2017, uh, the California MUTC is gonna add some more updates on the class four bikeways. So I would definitely encourage you to come back to those web pages and follow up on that. Um, but there's been a number of blanket approvals, and a lot of people will ask, well, can we do this or can we do this? And oftentimes, if there's a blanket approval, all you have to do is let Caltrans know you're doing it in your city. And, and rectangular rapid flashing beacons were back in 2011, and those have been being put in communities throughout California and throughout the nation. And then we did the green colored pavement uh, for bike lanes, and then the optional use of bicycle signal faces. Um, and that's going to be important for protected intersection crossings, and we're going to get into that a little bit more in this document. And then uh, the optional use of the intersection bike box was done in uh, April of this year. And we're really excited because the two-stage bicycle turn boxes just uh, from FHWA just came out July 7th of 2017, and Caltrans is, is quickly uh, working to adopt it at the August 2017 uh, California Traffic Control Devices Committee meeting. So that will be used as a blanket approval in California. So um, another way of, of helping people navigate their intersections in their communities. Um, Caltrans also launched this Main Street California Guide to Improving Community and Transportation Vitality. Remember, vitality and livability uh, and economy are really important in their mission statement. And so a lot of their state highways go through small and rural towns um, it, throughout California, and they really wanted to give a guide and a toolbox, uh, toolbox of resources that local agencies can be using uh, to improve their main streets. And, and this is a, a, an incredible document. It's available online. Um, and then 
in based on the legislation that CalBike helped author, um, the Design Information Bulletin 89 was released on December 30th of 2015, creating the new Class 4 separated bikeway uh, uh, guidelines uh, for uh, separated bikeway guidelines, uh, also known as cycle tracks. Um, and so that was a, a monumental feat. Um, and shortly after that, uh, CalBike created a brochure, and you can go to this web link below here um, to uh, download this brochure on Class 4 separated bikeways, and they're approved for use in, in California. And that picture right there is a really incredible picture uh, by Mike and Philip, two incredible engineers at the city of Modesto that I get to work with a lot. Um, that is the new... Uh, uh, Freeway 99 going over the old Highway 99, and they repurposed the old Highway 99 when it was relinquished to them uh, through an overlay project, and we're going to talk about this case study of how they did that project later on in this presentation, but that picture is is a cost-effective solution of connecting a community, and, and it, it shows new and old in various ways uh, of our mindset and our mission in California. Um, in that document, though, that CalBike released was what are what is a separated bikeway? And they can be one-way facilities, they can be two-way facilities, they they can have some physical separation, a concrete curves, landscaping, parking lanes, bollards, and other vehicle elements. And class fours are distinctly different than class one and class two. And you can go into the MUTCD and the Highway Design Manual and really uh, understand the differences. But we're going to try to cover some of those uh, today. And in that document, we also identified some concerns because there are a lot of misinformation out there or being information being thrown out there that that causes a little anxiety or fear or concern of trying something new. And so will my city be liable for separated bikeways? And, and as long as you uh, document your decisions, and now that Caltrans has it, uh, included it, um, the, the answer is no. And so uh, there's ways to, um, to reduce uh, your liability. Um, the separate bikeways violate high, California Highway Design Manual rules, and the answer is no, especially since uh, Caltrans uh, created design flexibility and you need to just in, it, document your engineering decisions. And will separate bikeways be more dangerous at intersections and driveways? And, and the answer is um, no, there's ways to address intersections and driveways and enhance those, and one of those is protected intersections and protected crossings of intersections, and, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And, and then there's signing and striping that can be used to enhance the awareness, and we'll, and we'll talk about those. Um, and are separate bikeways more expensive? And the answer is not always. They can be. If you really want to give a platinum solution, you can design something to be very expensive. You can also do things very cost effective, and we'll get into some of the ways that you can do that. Um, but back in uh, 2016, these were some of the cities in California that were, were implementing separated bikeways already. And here we are almost a year later, and um, there's two to three dozen more cities in California that are planning, designing, and uh, implementing separated bikeways throughout California. So it's a really exciting time for mobility in California. And to be an engineer and a planner and a landscape architect and an urban designer. So, um, so the latest design guidance. Here are a number of manuals that have been, ha have been released in the last decade. Maybe even in the last five years, most of them have been released. Uh, so there's lots of guidance out there um, that, you know, if you went to college 20 years ago and haven't been going to continuing education, there's a lot of information that has been e e evolving um, at, that you can use at your fingertips. And a lot of this stuff is available to download online or you can purchase for a nominal fee. So these are just some of the covers of some of the books that have come out. Um, but for separated bike uh, ways, the FHWA guide, that's what the Design Information Bulletin 89 for Caltrans really points back to. It was it is a, a very thorough document. Um, the Urban Bikeway Design Guide from NACTO is another great document to, to talk about separated bikeways. And then here at Alta, we created a white paper to enhance uh, the 
uh, profession on the awareness of protected intersections. And there are five such protected intersections or at the time of this authoring uh, in, in North America and or in United States, I believe. And um, so you can just type in evolution of protected intersection in your Google search and it'll come up with this white paper. And it really talks about the nuances of, of separate or protected intersections. And that's really to help you with the crossings and how to handle the approaches at intersections. So I definitely encourage you to go check that document out. And then here recently, FHWA just came out with a small town and rural multimodal networks. And this was a, in response to a lot of local agencies throughout America. Uh, and when we saw, say, small town and rural design, that's, that's cities and towns, 250,000 people or less, right? That's 95, 98% of America's cities um, uh, re re reflect this. They weren't. They were seeing the, the tall buildings of, of NACTO and saying we can't do that infrastructure. And so really um, this, this book, it, this manual is really focused on the small town and rural designs. You know, the two or three story, the one story streets um, and showing how a rural context or, or in a suburban context, um, some of the principles can be applied. Um, and FHWA released this, which is, it's a great document and it just came out in 2017. So it's hot off the press. Um, but when you're doing design for separated bikeways, it's really important to, to be informed of all the design guidelines and, and, and have a cyclical uh, informed process. And if you're starting with FHWA using their guideline and then the manual and uniform traffic control devices um, and then the urban bikeway design guide and all the other, those other manuals and really looking for the context um, so you have context sensitive design for the needs and values of your street and your community in which you're trying to design. And it's, and it's definitely not a one size fits all. So just because the separated bikeway was designed this way in this city doesn't mean that has to be designed that way in your city. There's, there's a, a lot of permutations uh, on how you can design these in your communities. But it really comes down to who are we designing our roadways for? Are, are we designing it for the super athletic um, the top 1% or 2% of, of, of people using our roadways or want to be using our roadways on bicycles, or are we, are we designing it so that maybe um, a, a young lady in her dress um, uh, and everyday clothes wants to ride her bike because there's not parking available in downtown or it's easier to ride a bike or it's healthier to ride a bike or, you know, she just wants to get out and experience her community. One way, I have a friend, Howard Blackson, that uh, said uh, biking is, is a, kills apathy, right? If you have a, a lot of people in your community that are, that are apathetic, uh, build bicycle infrastructure that gets them connected with your community and gets them connected with each other and businesses and really creates a connected community. Um, but are we really re being relevant to our public? And ITE came out with this article um, creating great communities through transportation, a, a perspective on becoming more relevant to the public. And, and biking is one of those ways, and, and separated bikeways are one of those ways to build great, transport, or great communities through transportation rather than transportation through communities, which we've been doing for uh, largely since post-World War II. So Trying to cure traffic congestion with more capacity is like trying to cure obesity by loosening your belt. And trust me, I've tried to lose my belt, loosen my belt a number of times. And, and really, you have to change your lifestyle. You have to change your practices. And you have to change your, um, your food intake. And you have to change what you're doing. And, and I think that's what is another message is we really need to change our design and how we're building options and choices in our community so that people have an opportunity to do something other than drive in their car. Uh, um, and it doesn't take that much, that many people doing that to, re to reduce congestion and to change congestion. Um, so we've seen a number of buffered bike lanes and this would be a class two buffered bike lane. Um, with, and you can see them on the door side to protect a, a bicyclist from being doored or you, on the left side you can see uh, the buffer between the travel lane and the bike lane, and those are uh, buffered bike lanes, and we call those class two facilities. Um, and here's some of the dimensions and uh, and 
what you can be doing. Um, but really, those buffers for bike lanes really help with the new three-foot passing law in California. So without a buffer, here is the distance between the bicyclist and a vehicle. And as you reduce the lane width of the travel lane and you create a buffer, you can now create 3.8 feet, which is in excess of the separated uh, three-foot passing lock. And if you put a little bit bigger buffer, you even have more shy distance between you and the most vulnerable users of the roadway. And this really has a great impact on people's willingness and invite, being welcome and invited to the, to the roadway so that they're not right next to a very large vehicle. And it helps slow down some of those larger vehicles um, so that um, they're more part of your community rather than driving through your community. Um, and here are some examples uh, of a left side buffer changing to a door side buffer. Uh, for a bike lane in Carlsbad that I helped design. And then in San Diego, they took out an entire travel lane and changed it to a left side and a right side buffer. And, and, and look at the space that that uh, uh, bike rider has to ride up that street. And buffered bike lanes, you know, are often to the left of a parked vehicle. And if we just um, switch the, the bike lane and the parking, we, we created a separated bikeway. And it, the irony is back in 1968, I believe it was, Davis was experimenting between this and this. Um, uh, and they ultimately chose putting the bike lane out next to traffic. Um, uh, and here we are 40 or 50 years later, and we're, we're bringing back the separated bikeways. And, and we've seen a, how a lot of success in They've been implemented in many cities throughout the United States with lots of great success and lots of great mode splits and ride share, um, especially as you create a network of them. So building class four separated bikeways, um, as I said earlier, also known as cycle tracks, protected bike lanes, separated bike lanes. You can Google all of those and you can get a lot of great information out there. Um, but a lot of times we say, well, where should separate bike lanes go? And, and, and really, places with many bicycles are where you want to attract bicyclists to. And anywhere you want to reduce the stress level of bicycling, downtowns are great, great locations, multi-lane multi streets, streets with double parking or loading, streets with high parking turnover. Those are all great locations for separated bikeways. Really, any street can be a great location, and so and we'll get into that a little bit more about what kind of streets should be should these be going on. Here's some of the different materials that you'll see separated bikeways. You know, it could be painted, it could be concrete, it could be parking wheel stops, it could be vertical delineators, it could be planters, um, and um, just anything creating separation between the moving car and the bike rider. Those are both one way in both directions, so one way on both sides of the roadway. Um, and then you can create um, you can create them separated horizontally, but you can also separate them vertically and raise them up to the sidewalk level, or you can create a, a, a vertical barrier of concrete. I, I will say that sometimes um, pin down concrete curbs in these situations are a lot more cost effective than tearing up the roadway and, uh, and impacting uh, the structure of the roadway underneath to put in these thing, uh, these curb barriers. So just pin down concrete curbs are really easy to do. And I'll show you an example of where we created slots in them so that drainage can go through them and get back to the other gutter that has always been collecting the stormwater so you don't have to have a secondary stormwater treatment. Um, but here are some of the dimensions, and you'll use you'll see the word minimum. But really, we, as we go back to FHWA and Caltrans, we should be going beyond the minimum, and we should be looking for preferred widths, and we should be looking for pre preferred dimensions, and and where we can get those preferred dimensions. That that that's what we should be striving for. And here's one of those intersection crossings in Denver, Colorado, and you can see they just use. Um, let me go back that to green paint, uh, and they created a bike lane uh, crossing outside of the crosswalk for pedestrians. 
Um, here is one in Minneapolis, and, it, and this was before Bollards. You can see the parked vehicles encroaching into the separated bikeway, and then they added the, the delineator, the vertical delineators, and all of a sudden the cars stayed out really nicely. And the raised cycle track in Missoula, Montana, is a, is a si sidewalk level um, separated bikeway. And then two-way protected bike lanes are another great way, and, and that 8 to 12 is, is, is just a minimum dimensions. You can, we, we're in the process of designing one uh, for Sandag down here in San Diego on Pershing Bikeway that it, I believe will be about 14 feet in width. Uh, um, so um, intersection control is important, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but uh, three-foot buffer so the park car doors can open. And here's, here's an example of implementation, and that picture that we were talking with is exactly uh, what we're showing in those graphics, and, and, and this is the result of implementation, people using these separated bikeway facilities, and that's what we're striving for. Uh, Two-way concerns, you'll see here that a lot of times, you know, a car will be parked there, um, you know, site visibility issues and, and whatnot, and so there are some ways with curb extensions, bowl bouts, tighter curb return radius, signing and striping and, and bringing sight lines in for all users that you can enhance those crossings. Um, so we'll get into a little bit about that. But then the guidance of bicycle facilities. And you can see there's a, a bunch of tools to move people on bicycles throughout the community. You can have bicycle boulevards in neighborhoods. You can have bike routes. You can have bike lanes. So you go to from class three to class two, to buffered class two bike lanes, to class four cycle tracks, to class one pathways. Um, and where do they make sense based on daily traffic volumes, speeds of the roadway? Uh, you know, is it collector, is it arterial? Um, you know, separation, um, you know, minimum, maximum. Uh, there's all sorts of information here that, that you can you can glean from this slide, and we created this uh, as some information for some of our clients. Um, but low-cost solutions, and I think this is, is um, where we can make a lot of progress really quickly in California. Um, we don't always have to make the platinum um, solution. We can implement this, and then we can come back, and it can evolve over time. So we can put it in quickly with paint and vertical delineators, and then we can come back and, and enhance it or beautify it or, street, or enhance the streetscape. And so um, I use this saying a lot, low speed kills when it comes to delivering projects to improve safety. Um, and so we need to be identifying ways to deliver cost effective projects faster to align with community values and needs. We don't need to be always identifying a hundred million dollar solution or a, a billion dollar solution and it takes 10 to 20 years to get that project from concept to construction. We need to be looking for how do we get something from concept to construction and six months, six weeks, uh, a year, um, and how do we move a little bit faster to, to address some of our safety challenges in our community, especially as communities are focusing on Vision Zero, and communities, and Vision Zero is reducing or eliminating fatalities in our communities. Um, so one way to do that is through resurface and per repurpose, and back in 2010, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, had a lot of money that a lot of communities used. And when I was a city traffic engineer and president, we did about 30 miles of, of new bike lanes and 15 of them through road diets um, where we, we just removed a travel lane and created space for bike lanes on, on streets. Um, but we did that as part of our routine maintenance and we had some extra money through ARA and, and, and identified you know, five mile stretches of roadways that connected people by schools and shopping centers and and on collector roadways. And we and we made a lot of improvements in, in, in our bicycle network, especially in, in areas that were socially and equitably challenged with bicycle infrastructure. Um, but as you resurface a project uh, or a roadway, I say it's like giving an engineer a blank canvas or an artist a blank canvas. And then you, we can use the Etch-a-Sketch to create our new um, new solution, uh, and, and so as soon as you put the the roadway the new asphalt down, the what was there is gone. And so what would you do now since you have a new roadway? Um, and and we've seen communities uh, like Fremont 
that over the last three years they adopted a 10-foot travel lane policy and they've been using that extra space they've been created to do buffered bike lanes throughout their community and they have now 15 miles of buffered bike lanes just in three years by through their routine uh, overlay projects. Uh, City of Carlsbad has also done that. Um, but it's really cost effective to do it while you're resurfacing a project. Um, it, it's on the order to a uh, magnitude of half the cost of implementing it with just striping when you're overlaying it uh, or slurry sealing a, a roadway. Um, and I think we need to be opportunistic. Uh, you know, a lot of our aging infrastructure like sewer and water are going to be tearing up our roadways to replace the infrastructure. And those are great opportunities to use utility maintenance dollars to put a new overlay on your roadway and to allow new striping for separated bikeways or buffered bike lanes or whatever might be in your community. However, you can get more space for people to ride their bikes in your community. Um, here is an example that we did in Carlsbad. Um, this is across the Buena Vista Lagoon and it was connecting the City of Oceanside and the city of Carlsbad across this lagoon, and it was a three lane roadway that was built back in the 60s, much to the highway design standards of the, of the era. And you can see two northbound lanes, one southbound lane. Those are fog lines, those aren't even bike lanes, the bike lanes. But sometimes you have 3,000 bike riders going across this roadway and a lot of pedestrians, and there's no space for either of them in the top picture. And so we just used the same edge of pavement to edge of pavement. And we did one lane in each direction for travel lanes, bike lanes in both directions, class two bike lanes. And then we really created a class four facility uh, to the right over there. And you can see the, those are just pinned down concrete curbs there where we dialed into the existing asphalt and then formed up the concrete curbs. And those slots that are 12 to 18 inches wide allow the storm water when that, that roadway might flood on high tide or, or on a storm, uh, on a high storm in the lagoon. Um, to just flow across the river and back across the roadway like it always has rather than creating a whole new storm drain facility on this roadway and, and making a, a roadway maintenance or a bike lane project uh, into a storm drain project. And so this is a great example of a community really figuring out a cost-effective solution um, to mobility challenges between two communities. Uh, but I often say, can we really afford level of service? And level of service practices creates um, sustainable, sustainability economically, environmentally, and health-wise, and we'll get in a little bit about that. But the roadway on the left is a two-lane roadway that's moving 9,000 cars at, at 30 miles an hour. The roadway on the right is also moving 9,000 cars at 55 miles an hour. We know speed has a direct correlation with safety, but one has more space um, and is, is more uh, inviting, has less exposure to the vulnerable users, and the other one has a lot of exposure. And so, um, you know, a lot of times the one on the right was created by a travel demand model and projections out 20 or 30 years that never came to fruition. And so it'll never move more than nine, 12,000 cars, and yet it's a five-lane roadway, and that agency has to maintain 40% more asphalt than they would if they would have just built a three-lane roadway or a two-lane roadway to move those 9,000 cars. Um, so can, re can we really afford level service? It, it causes the extra asphalt to maintain, barriers for pedestrians to cross, faster speeds which require more enforcement and our law enforcement are already taxed to the max, um, faster speeds, higher severity of injury when collisions occur, so we're trying to achieve vision zero but we're building really high fast roadways. And then it's also a poor utilization of our infrastructure. You know, over the last four or five decades, we've seen transportation and roadways take up from go from 20% to 40, 50% of our land in our communities, which is non-taxable. But it, it also results in higher development impact fees. And I'll say the disclaimer, it often disconnects people and communities from their potential. And I think it, that is a really important part when we look at enhancing economy and livability and vitality in our communities. So level of service, um, from an, these are the same roadways, just different times of the day, and to economists versus a driver. But how do we make these roadways better for people, and how do we address congestion if we don't have bicycle lanes, if we don't have separated facilities, if we don't give people choices and options to their to their vehicle? They're always going to be in this picture on the right. If you were riding a bicycle, you could get through that corridor a heck of a lot faster than even at 
five or ten miles per hour than all those cars that are stopped in congestion. So um, it, it gives people say, ah, you know what, I don't want to be in congestion. I want to go get my exercise rather than driving home and then going to the gym. I might just ride my bike home and get a little exercise and raise my heartbeat and become a more active, healthy lifestyle in my community. So um, here was one uh, 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 sidewalk level uh, separated bikeway facility. Um, and, I, and it was back in the Massachusetts area, uh, uh, Boston or Cambridge. Um, but it was a utility project that reconstructed this roadway, and instead of putting the, the roadway and the sidewalk back identical, they just put in new, uh, they extended it out and put it in a separated bikeway facility. Um, and here's how they handled the crossing. They did tighter curb return radii. They delineated space for a bicyclist to cross the roadway. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll see that you'll do driveway ramps um, or an elevated crosswalk or, or something like that to, to allow the motors to realize they're yielding to somebody else when they're turning into those roadways. And so there's a lot of different design treatments that you can do. You can see the sign that says turning vehicle yield to bicyclists and pedestrians up there right behind that pole. Um, down here in San Diego, Sandag has their regional early action bike program. And one of their projects is Pershing Bikeway, um, which connects North Pound North Park to downtown San Diego, and it goes through Balboa Park. And this is the old State Route 173, um, which was going to be a, free, uh, a highway or a freeway uh, through San Diego, and it never got built. And so, um, and so this roadway is going through one of the top five urban parks in the nation, Balboa Park, and it has really minimal bike lanes and the speeds out there are 50 to 60 miles an hour, and there's a lot of collisions and crashes and, and uh, and it's just not a roadway that's designed to, for a park. And so we said, well, what if we put in a separated bikeway facility and we changed it to a one lane in each direction, which the traffic volumes will allow, and we can repurpose the lanes, and then we design it for more of a 30 to 35 mile an hour range for the vehicles, and we create uh, like a 14 foot wide sep two way separated bike lane. We add sidewalks and we add a decomposed granite so it's more trail like. Um, and then we took a picture and we looked at it. What it, would it be from a user's perspective on a bicycle going up here? And, and is this a pleasant experience? Is this inviting? And, and uh, we're excited about that project. And th this, this project up here in the left corner is one of the crossings at Florida and uh, Pershing and 26th Street. And you can see instead of just doing an entire protected intersection, we're just doing a protected crossing uh, of one approach or leg of the intersection at, on 26th Street. Uh, the one on the bottom right is uh, one of the first separated or protected intersections in, in, the, in the United States in Salt Lake City. And then again, the evolution of the protected intersection white paper is up there if you'd like to learn more about protected intersections. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me about them. Um, in San Francisco, they just installed uh, this protected intersection. And you can see uh, some different color paint and, and raised medians and, and whatnot um, and creating bikeway crossings and, and sidewalk crossings. Um, and you know, a lot of times people say, well, we don't have space for a protected intersection. And sometimes uh, you, you may or you may not, but I, I think this is an opportunity to say, why did we put in this right turn lane so that the, free, the throughput of the travel lane could be faster, right? Well, what if we said that, that right turn lane is more valuable to move people, and so let's create a protected crossing. And, and here's an example of, of changing that roadway. And, and then you add trees and you add redevelopment. This is enhancing the livability and economy of this community. Um, and here is another two-way cycle track um, and, and the striping that was used for there. And I think it depends on every roadway and every intersection and every crossing how you want to handle this. This also has a bike sig bike based signal, and that um, you can do that in California as well. So I think. Uh, understanding what your opportunities and challenges are and, and understanding the context of what you're de designing and how what, what makes the most sense to get people across the roadway. Um, in Modesto, they were focused on connecting two campuses. They have two junior college campuses. They have the East Campus and the West Campus, and they're about two miles apart, which is about a you know 10 to 20 minute bike ride uh, for most able-bodied uh, people uh, in in on their bicycle. And so 
as they were resurfacing this two-mile corridor, they said, well, why don't we put in a separate bikeway? And this is uh, Michael and Philip in the city of Modesto. And if you're ever in the Central Valley um, in Modesto, uh, look up Michael and Philip. They're doing amazing things in the city of Modesto uh, and really enhancing the safety and mobility and connectivity of people riding bicycles and active transportation in their communities. So, um, But going over... The overcrossing, that they put in a concrete barrier, and they and and that was, I believe, it was just a pin down uh, barrier. Um, but you can see uh, when there was no one coming in the opposite direction, people were riding side by side. And if somebody was coming in the opposite direction, they would just move over. And it's been great to observe how well these have been uh, working. And here's the there here's um, the old State Route 99 corridor in which they took one travel lane away and they put in wheel stops and vertical delineators and created uh, the space. And you can see there's a student with his backpack going to campus. Um, and here is that famous picture uh, with the new uh, freeway going over the old highway and how transportation has evolved over the years in the Central Valley and in the state of California from focusing on building freeways and highways uh, to now building uh, separated bike lanes, and this is uh, an incredible uh, picture that shows the the contrast of all of it. Um, and then they created a brochure, Campus Connection, and 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 highlighted what to use and how to use it, and and then showed on a map, and it's that blue line right there in the middle, uh, um, connecting the the West Campus and the East Campus, um, and that's available on their line uh, on online for, at their webpage. But I really want us to get back to focusing on what are we trying to do? We're trying to connect people, and this is a mother and her two daughters that rode their bikes to a downtown setting to Yo Diggity business, a business for frozen yogurt to spend quality mother-daughter time and spend money in the community. And so we're really connecting people with businesses and destinations. And that's how we enhance economy and livability in our communities. And with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Brian. Excellent presentation. I'm sure that we have a lot of questions. A lot of so questions are... Like... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go, go right ahead. Well, no, I mean, I have, I've divided the questions into uh, various categories. Okay. There are design guidance questions that you might be reluctant to be too specific about. So um, I, let, me, let, me lump, let me lump them all into one and, and, and ask you for your advice on, on what people can do to get specific answers. Okay. People, people are especially curious about how to deal with two-way cycleways at intersections because it's more difficult to deal with them at intersections than it is one-way cycle tracks at intersections. Um, people yeah, it, are. It, it, people are. That, that, that's a great question. Go ahead. And I think it, it really depends on the context and the space on the roadway that you can create. Um, you can. You can create a two-way cycle track with less space than you can with two one-way cycle tracks. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to have two one-way cycle tracks because everybody is wanting to be on one side of the roadway. And so if you have a lot of people that are what we call salmon bike riders that are riding upstream or, or upstream or the wrong way on one side of the roadway, oftentimes it's because they don't want to cross over to the roadway on the other side to go up three or four blocks to cross back over. And so sometimes it, with, when all the land uses that they're desiring to go to are on one side of the roadway, it just makes sense to put the two-way cycle track on that side and allow them to be connected where the land use is and where they want to be. And so I think that's where the desire path and having an understanding of the user and the user's experience that you're trying to create. So I, I'm not sure that it's um, necessarily just design uh, guidance, but sometimes it's context sensitivity, land use, what you're trying to achieve. Um, well, I understand. Uh, but there are, and, and I understand there, there are. That's why yeah. you would put a, a cycle track on one side, but when you get to the intersection, 
motorists are not necessarily expecting to see a bicycle coming from the opposite direction. Uh, right. Where can people go to find design treatments that can mitigate that danger? Well, that white paper on the protected intersection crossing that Alta Planning and Design uh, authored is a good location. Um, and then uh, for protected intersection crossings. And, and then uh, looking at the signing and striping that's available in the California MUTCD, in the Highway Design Manual, um, and um, and then the FHWA guidance on separated bikeways. Um, there's a lot of information uh, in there on how to enhance, and it, it sometimes it's it's varying degrees of of treatments. Um, you know, it could be a raised uh, crosswalk, it could be green paint, it could be um, tighter curb return radii, it could be um, uh, a, a number of different treatments to enhance the awareness of motorists anticipating somebody riding in a direction that they're not expecting them to ride in. Um, but what I will say is that these things are already occurring in our communities. People are riding the wrong ways on sidewalks because they're not riding in the streets next to cars. And so, um, um, we, but, so part of it is education and part of it is, is just designing it such a way so that, um, there's an awareness to something unique or different at that intersection. With slow speeds as a With key slow point, speed, yes. I would imagine. Yes. Quickly slow developing. Turning, slow, slow turning speeds. Quick design solutions to slow down, or I should say fast design solutions to slow down traffic. Yes. People uh, ask about the variety of vertical separation and delineators that you can use. Where can they go for information about what's, what kind of separator is appropriate for uh, which kind of street, especially with regard to speed? Well, you know, there, there's information that you can go to um, in the, the the FHWA guidance, um, and as um, more and more documents and manuals are being updated, like uh, the Massachusetts uh, guideline, um, that's another uh, available tool. Um, but I think as, as these questions come up, I think they're going to be we're going to have more and more guidance to them. Um, to and as we build more of these separated bikeways, we're going to have a greater understanding and awareness to where are those thresholds um, and can we quickly implement something with paint and vertical delineators and then work towards doing something long term uh, that is more structurally uh, separated. But I think the, th the key thing to remember is we didn't build curbs and gutters for sidewalks to keep cars off the sidewalks. We built them for storm drain. And so, um, you know, that's where I think designing um, our, our roadways, um, sometimes we say, oh, we need to have six inch, inches or eight inches to keep the car out of the separated bikeway, and and that isn't always the case, and so I think you can use parking protected. You can do a number of different solutions, um, but changing the characteristics of the roadway and also the speeds of the roadway are, are Im improvements, and so you can do that through the physical design of the roadway as you're implementing the separated bikeway, just like that example we did uh, for Sandag, taking the roadway from 55, 60 miles an hour and designing it for something in the 30 mile per hour range. Brian, I have one more design question and then uh, maybe uh, uh, about four more questions uh, about policy and okay. politics. Uh, the last design question is uh, for your opinion on the difference between a cycle track at the curb level on the sidewalk versus a, a cycle track at street level? Well, the cycle track at the street level can be a lot more cost effective because you're not moving curb and gutter and sidewalk and, 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 and the like. And so, you know, it really depends on your available funds um, and then what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, uh, the, the vertical separation is great. And we've seen vertical separation that is half the height of the sidewalk 
and then we've seen it at the same height of the sidewalk. And so um, there's a lot of great ways to do all of that. Um, and, you know, I, I think, again, it goes back to the context and what you're trying to achieve in the city uh, and the street, the particular street you're trying to work. I, I don't think there's a, a one-size-fits-all answer to should you do street-level separated cycle, cycle tracks versus uh, raised cycle tracks. Got it. So now I have a clarification question that points to uh, policy and politics, and I'll answer that one myself before okay. asking you about uh, some public reaction to, to cycle tracks. Now the clarification question is cycle tracks, separated bikeway, class four, protected bike lanes. Why and where do you use those different terms? Why does it matter? So I'll start by saying that all of those terms refer to the exact same thing. It is a bikeway separated from motor vehicle tra traffic by some kind of physical separator. That's the legal definition in the California law. And for public consumption, it doesn't much matter what you use. The surveys have shown that the the easiest thing for people to understand is to call them protected bike lanes. So you will hear us and many refer to them as protected bike lanes on a regular basis because that's what they look like. That's what the public understands. But legally, we don't call them bike lanes because by law, when you're on a bicycle, you have to use the bike lane if it is present. And we don't want that requirement to apply to roads with class four separated bikeways because some people uh, don't want to use the separated bikeway. And there are uh, many good reasons why you might want to use the main roadway. So legally, they're not bike lanes. They're separated bikeways. The term cycle track refers to the exact same thing. It's what they call them in Europe, so you hear a lot of people referring to them as cycle tracks. Um, I hope that helps uh, clear things up. Uh, I don't think it matters much except that legally they're not bike lanes so that you don't have to use them when you're uh, on a bike if you don't want. Now to move to uh, uh, political question, Brian. Uh, how did you, uh, the communities that you work with, how did they react? to the development of changes, especially when it involved the removal of travel lanes? Well, you know, we, we, we've worked with a number of communities through pilot projects and demonstrations, uh, projects and, and full-on uh, concept of construction uh, documents. And, you know, it, it um, and, and I can remember in, in Fresno, I had, uh, uh, a lady called me up when I was the city traffic engineer and said, you're creating all sorts of congestion on this roadway um, by putting in these bike lanes and when we did a road diet. And, that, and I, I said, you know, and she was like the 14th caller that had called it congestion. And so I went out there and we drove it in the AM peak hour. We rode our bikes in the PM peak hour. We, we were out there for like a number of days looking at it. And we never saw congestion. And we saw people driving slower, but we didn't see them because on a four lane you could pass and you can and, and whatnot. And so the, this, the, another person called me up and said, um, it's congestion out there. And I'm like, can you describe what congestion is? And I'm, I'm not able to drive as fast as I want to. And having known that our, our traffic enforcement would, did a lot of enforcement out there, I said, have you got any citations out there? And they're like, yeah, three in the last 18 months. And I'm like, that's kind of expensive to be driving as fast as you want to be. And, he, and the person said, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, well, you know what? We're trying to design this roadway for the safe and prudent driver to be leading the way because we know there's a direct correlation between safety or speed and safety on our roadways. And, and by creating space for bicyclists, we're also in giving people the choices and options to avoid the congestion and, and ride their bikes. And so I think I think part of it is education and awareness and, and changing the story and the language that we're using um, to, to talk with people and really understanding where are they coming from. Um, you know, we had one community where they were a 15,000 person community 
and they were used to zipping around in their community and they grew to a 50,000 person community and and we took away one lane and they said oh my gosh it, it took me 20 cycles uh, or 20 it, it took me 20 minutes to get through this intersection and I said well with all due respect how many red lights did you wait at and they said one and I said well that's interesting because one red light is about two minutes at that intersection and, and, and I said I'm not saying you're exaggerating what you're telling me is your level of tolerance for congestion it is very low <laughs> and and uh -huh. so um, I, I think it's about balancing safety and changing the language and conversation so that a culture and a community can be uh, can be realized um, and providing choices and options in a healthier community and, and understanding those benefits um, and it's a lot easier to maintain roadways that bikes are riding on than trucks and buses and, and so reducing the amount of asphalt um, that is being wear and tear of vehicles is, is, a, is a good thing for communities. Well, I, I have a maintenance question, but first I'll address a couple of issues that people ask that can help them uh, convince their policymakers and their neighbors about the the potential positive impact of these. Somebody asked about safety statistics and somebody asked about the projections about an increase in the number of bicyclists and where can they get information on that. I would recommend peopleforbikes.org. They have a statistics page on their website that has all of the latest and greatest information on safety and mode share. Uh, it, is, it is the best place for data about American uh, facilities and American impact. Uh, on the issue of maintenance, Brian, um, what do you do about maintaining uh, bikeways? Yes, streets cheaper to maintain if you don't have uh, heavy vehicles running over as much of it, but you still have a, a separated bikeway that has special maintenance requirements. What do communities do uh, to deal with that? Well, I, I think there's two different philosophies to it. One is you can size your streets so that your maintenance vehicles can be as efficient as possible, or you can size your streets so your community can be as economically vibrant as possible and and then buy equipment that can be used for that. And I think a lot of times um, we, we're seeing cities uh, with separated bikeways, they're saying, oh, well, our, our street sweeper is 10 feet wide or 8 feet wide. We need it to be a minimum of 8 feet wide so we can get our street sweeper back there. And we're also seeing other cities that are their maintenance crews that are, are going out and purchasing an, uh, a CJ7 Jeep and attaching a street sweeper on the, onto it and sweeping the separated bikeways. And, and it's a special uh, situation where they get to once a week go uh, do the separated bikeways in their communities. And so I think, um, you know, it takes leadership. It takes um, understanding what the challenges are. And, and, it, and it really takes not designing your community to how you've always done things in the past, but really understanding what are their, their challenges. And, you know, we buy really big street sweepers so that we, have, that we don't have to make as many trips to the dump. Um, but if we can make if we can buy one smaller street sweeper um, that could do the street sweeping on the separate bikeways, it can be a lot better. Or some agencies are even contracting that out to a special vendor that can have all the equipment so that the agency doesn't have to have multiple different vehicles. They can just contract the street sweeping out on the separate bikeways to a contractor that goes out there, just like a shopping center has their parking lot swept um, by a street sweeper or vacuumed by a, sweep, a street cleaner, um, they're doing that. So we're seeing lots of different uh, ways that agencies are addressing uh, cleaning uh, separated bike cleans. Got it. And one more operational question, and then I think we're done. Okay. Uh, shoulders are often used for vehicles that are broken down uh, and delivery trucks, et cetera. How do we get around this issue with protected lanes? Can we still use protected lanes where there's a high amount of shoulder use? Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. We, we, you know, on on many of our uh, highways and freeways, we have eight feet to 10 feet dedicated to uh, disabled vehicles on, on the roadway. And, and in a lot of our urban areas, uh, we now have these uh, like 511 or all these different services 
where a tow truck can get there really quickly. And a lot of the metropolitan planning organizations have tow services on the freeways that are patrolling the freeways during their peak hours. Um, but I think the same thing can be done in our local communities. Um, and and do we? So if a separated bikeway is used for a, a an emergency situation for a little bit, um, is that the end of the world if it's used for the other 364 days? You know, that's a, a policy decision that an agency has to, to make. I think that there's there's ways that we can be addressing these. If the lane breaks down, um, you know, is it the end of the world? Um, you know, I was on my way home and there was a fire on the freeway and they shut down the entire freeway because of the fire so that the right. emergency personnel could put the fire out. So, you know, while there was a shoulder there and five travel lanes on the freeway, we couldn't use any of them. And so, um, you know, things happen. And I, I think we need to be designing for what we want rather than. Well, and I might, add, and I might add that in a situation where you have a lot of shoulder use, and, and I think the question would apply to regular class two bike lanes as well, when that bike lane or shoulder, which is used by people on bikes, is commonly blocked, you are imposing a hazard and a safety hazard on the uh, group of people you're especially trying to encourage by creating a separated protected bike lane that's not usable for uh, broken down vehicles. Uh, most people are going to find their way off of their roadway uh, and those who can't are going to be imposing uh, on uh, one of the traffic lanes and not on the uh, bike facility that you're trying to protect in the first place. So um, right. another reason why, why it's good to have a protected lane. I bet you people have more questions, Brian, that we didn't hear in this webinar. So I want to encourage folks to go ahead and send them to me and I will uh, ask for your expertise, Brian, if I can't deal with them myself. Uh, my email address is davebike.org. Uh, and with that, I want to thank Brian for your expertise. Thank you, Linda, for running this behind the scenes. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in.